coop, you know, if you aren't good at building coops, well, then hire somebody to build the coop or, you know, talk somebody into building the coop. I mean, that can be built like in a matter of two weekends, right? It just doesn't take that long. Buy the hens. I recommend everybody start out buying chicken feed. It's available and it's still fairly inexpensive right now. And you have so many other things to learn. Yes, there are ways that you can ultimately create the food for your chickens, but you've got so much to learn. Don't have that be one of the things. Plan that. That'll be stage two, right? <laughs> That's not stage one. And like, bam, I mean, really in three weeks after the hens have settled in, you know, because they you've moved them and, and they've got some adjustment. But really in three weeks, you can be having breakfast every day of your life now figured out. You know, digest on that for just a minute. They wanted the food to stop and the food is stopping. The farmers are stopping the food now. So where does it go from here? And you brought up a valid point there, Marjorie. Are the farmers in Europe going to plant? And at what percentage would they plant compared to their normal year? That's a, a very valid question to, to start crunching some numbers on. And good afternoon, everyone. It's time for us to really take sovereignty back for all of our food production. And as you saw in Oregon, they are now trying to limit and stop all small farms. If you have gravel or a concrete pad and an animal, because they consider that a contained food lot now. And then you could continue to have your cow, your sheep, your goats, your chickens, your rabbits, whatever it is, if it's a on a concrete or a stone area that is considered a contained feedlot now, and they require a hundred thousand U S dollars of infrastructure to comply with different regulations and runoff for a better term. So it's almost like we're going to have to become gorilla backyard meat producers. And, you know, the say the safest thing. And when I was growing up, you know, when you went to a party, the rule was never talk about religion, never talk about politics. And here we are now at the time where the safest possible thing you could talk about the weather and the climate is now the most dangerous thing to talk about at a party. And we're at a point now where they are actually going to try to shut you down from raising chickens, rabbits, having your own home gardens in the back. And we'll talk about this. But Marjorie Wildcraft's with us to give us some solutions on raising backyard meat sources, backyard meat production. It's at our fingertips and we need these solutions. We need to share them, share them wide and put them into practice. So Marjorie, I'm super glad you're here sharing the knowledge glad as always. And uh, the floor is yours. Glad to be here, Dave. Yeah. So I don't know if there's an update on that is they've shut down 50 farms in Maine now. And it's the same thing, which I really appreciate the work you've been doing, alerting like, hey, in Europe, they just come with new insane regulation that makes it impossible for farmers to farm. Uh, and if they don't comply, they become criminals. Uh, and and that's why the EU is having all that eruption of protests all across the European Union. And are I, are any of those farmers going to plant this spring? Probably not, you know. <laughs> and then I thought, well, you know, it's Europe, right? But nope. And then it popped out in Oregon. They're doing that. Now Maine, 50 farms in Maine. And what it is is these farmers were given basically bio sludge. They said, hey, will you put this as fertilizer for your land? which we all know is contaminated with all kinds of stuff. And now they're going back to those farmers and saying, hey, your farms are contaminated. We have to shut them down because you can't grow food there. And it was because of the stuff they gave. I mean, it was a total trap. So yeah, I, it's intentional. There, There is an intentional shutting down of the food supply. Now people go, oh, Marjorie, and they think, oh, gardens. And I'm like, actually, meat products are more efficient produce more calories per moment of time and per square foot than anything else. And I have gotten so much flack from the vegans and vegetarians and God bless Joel Salatin, man, he knows how to argue with them so well. He's got the words that guy can debate, but um, yeah, backyard meat production. And um, people think also of chickens and they say, Hey, like, you know, I'm, we're going to be raising my own chicken. You're not going to raise your own chickens for meat. And here's the one distinction why is chickens are omnivores just like us. And they'd like to eat things we like to eat, like grains and vegetables and all that sort of stuff, right? Although they do like insects and other things we don't like to eat. But rabbits are pure herbivores. And so they tend to take, they can turn into protein and fat things that we would not normally eat, like grass or forage or bark or, you know, your landscape trimmings. Uh, so 
I've really been recommending to people, you know, one buck and three breeding does. The Fed took the punch bowl away from the party again. The stock market's been betting on March rate cuts, but not so fast. Is this why JP Morgan and UBS are calling for a 23% drop in the S&P? The recession indicators ringing its most severe alarm in 40 years. Call the proud Americans of the Patriot Gold Group today before it's too late. Mention the ADAPT 2030 channel. You're going to get some great in-class service. Also, Patriot Gold Group has a no fee for life IRA where your IRA or 401k can be in physical gold or silver. No fee for life IRA on qualifying rollovers. Give them a call 888-546-7020. And now on with the video. Uh, here in the tropics, easily 100 rabbits a year out of that setup. And when I was in Texas, I was regularly getting between 75 and 85 a year. And that, that's because it gets so hot there. They, they can't breathe. It's, nobody wants to be pregnant in Texas in the summertime. You know, it's horrible. Um, that's a lot of meat. So a rabbit is just, a, just like a chicken. It's very equivalent to a chicken in terms of size and weight and taste even. Um, and all of your chicken recipes, you can absolutely just replace rabbit with it. And, you know, you can seamlessly go on with your life. Uh, in fact, many, many times I have fed people rabbit and forgot, you know, oh, here's the enchiladas. And they just assumed they were chicken enchiladas. And I'm like, well, you know, uh, <laughs> I forgot to tell them because we eat it so much. You know, it's just a part of our diet because they're they're such prolific. And really, they're, they're quiet. Um, there's not a smell that's necessarily going to alert anybody. They're small. You know, most homeowners associations, if you're not allowed to have chickens, they don't say anything about rabbits, you know. So <laughs> if you're deciding to pay attention to those rules, like that little mini government. Um, yeah, so fabulous. Um, the, 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 to be able to produce the food for the rabbits is actually surprisingly easy also. So um, yeah, I'm a real big proponent of, of animal products and um, rabbits by and large. The last big surge of rabbit production we had was in the 1970s. And the 70s in the United States was a very difficult decade. Like Nixon took us off the gold standard. There was really, really high inflation. Interest rates were going up. Nobody had a job. Stagflation was the word, right? And there were a lot of people who headed out to the hills and a lot of backyard rabbit production was going on. Uh, because backyard food production is what people turn to in times of crisis. And we're we are there now. <laughs> this is time to do it. Yeah, and when the agencies of your own nation come by and say you can't grow food on your own property or raise meat source on your own property, that becomes a very big problem because the system that we currently rely on is going to continue to hyperinflate in price. Like I just saw today on Zero Hedge. Cocoa producers are scrambling because the cocoa prices eclipsed all-time highest ever. It was about three months ago, and now they've gone straight up vertical into a hyperinflationary event. Oh, my God. Yeah, an I'm OMG to... on that. I encourage everybody to take a look at it on how fast. It's, not, it's just vertical on the pricing. Now it really oh becomes God. who has the money to purchase that. But then what if it is just corn products or wheat products? Then what? Because, you know, I want to give a shout out to uh, Charlie Rankin over at uh, yes, Yana Sam yeah. Ama Ranch, who's the one. He races bison in North Carolina. And he was the one who put out the original article that uh, Mike Adams picked up and spread around through the net that is giving us that information about the CAFOs or the con contained feedlot information out of Oregon. Now, I hadn't heard about the one in Maine, but yeah. Digging through what I dig through in terms of legislation. Also, I keep getting a lot of PDFs. People go, hey, you know, thank you for all the hat tips for everybody out there. I really appreciate it. I do read. If you send me there's a PDF, I will dig through it eventually when I have time. But one thing I came across was a new uh, one. We'd heard that eventually in the future, they were going to come for our home gardens and you'd have to get a permit or they'd limit what you could grow. But even inside there, there's a couple bylines. And I wanted to throw these to you and then get your reaction. Uh, when you grow the garden, you leave most people, including myself, leave rootstock in there to churn that over for just extra biomass material for the next year. 
if you leave the rootstocks in, uh, you will have to pay a CO2 and methane tax because the rootstocks are going to decompose and release those gases in the earth after you finish already and you cut whatever plant it is. It could be corn, could be bean, anything, radish, maybe you forgot it. There's a couple in there, they're rotting. But this is the level that it's going to be taken to and micromanaged, which means that somebody's going to have to come on your land and do all that measuring. So mm -hmm. if it's already, if they're envisioning it going out to that far end of the, of, of the pendulum swinging over there, that's a huge problem that they're even envisioning it and writing it on paper as a plan. So how do our communities around us stop such things from happening? Because you mentioned it, Marjorie, we, we got to stop it now. This is a terminator that is coming for us all. It will not stop. I don't care if yeah. you have to walk five miles to your cabin with no road, with no electricity in the forest. It is coming for you. It will not stop until it envelops and controls everybody and everything. It's no longer trying to hide from it and buy yourself time. I realize that here on this trip. We have to stop it. There's no other way around it. It has to stop. So in 2015, Cargill, you know, and they tell you what they're doing, right? They're, the plans are yes. there. It's in that PDF. It, it's usually buried or it's hidden in movies or, you know, what, but, but they do tell you. And if you, you use your intu intuition, you can find it. Well, in 2015, Cargill, which is the world's largest privately held company, uh, and they have their fingers in, in control over the entire global food supply, basically you know, farms, seed companies, everything, distribution, everything. And I, I saw, you know, normally when you have a big private company, they go, okay, you have to go public because you're too big, right? And I saw they said there was some write-up about Cargill and they said, no, they are so big and complex, we could never take them public. I'm like, wow. <laughs> anyway, in 2015, they sponsored a one of those scenarios, right? And it was called the uh, food chain reaction crisis, something like that. You can still see it's still, there's still some remnants of it up on the, on the internet. And I wasn't as aware or clued in to how important it was to look at these scenarios that they're doing, right? But I was always mystified because the sound bites that came out of it. Uh, oh, so the scenario was this 2020, something big happens on the planet, starts changing things. Then we start having all kinds of weird weather events and, you know, different calamities and the food supply starts costing more and more and more money. Uh, you know, what happens in third world countries and then food riots break out everywhere. You know, you know what happens as you basically shut off the food supply to the planet. And so they were scenarioing that. And the, uh, the soundbite they gave for the end of it was, in the end, cooperation won and a global carbon tax was implemented or like it solved the problem. And I, I used to always wonder how, what, why would a global car, how would a global carbon tax have anything to do with, you know, like what that just never, you know, it never, you know, I put that in the back of my mind as one of those WTF thoughts, like, how is that connected? Right. You know, that I go on with life and just exactly what you're saying is, is, is how I'm seeing that I'm connecting the dots here. They're, they're wanting to use this, 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 carbon credit thing, this carbon crisis, which is, as you've so wonderfully and elegantly reported on over time, is is just completely a made up thing um, to totally control. It's like what they're doing with these uh, farmers in Oregon. They just totally make up some kind of crazy legislation, which they have control of all of our governments. Uh, and so they can go ahead and get this legislation thing. And then they you have to comply to that. And then if, if you don't, then they send out their enforcement arms, which is because they own control and control the police and the military and everything else. Right. So we do, we do have to stop it. And, uh, but that is the plan and it's been a plan for a long time. And so that's the general gist is that they're going to be using these carbon taxes and carbon credits or whatever as the way, as the uh, enforcement legislation you're you're absolutely right. I loved I love the thing you mentioned on a on a podcast a while ago of like you know, your place tucked away way up in the in the mountains is is just going to buy you a minute of time. It's coming. It's coming to everybody. Um, and well, one we do have to be able to grow food. We just you just have to. You need to buy as much backup food as you can possibly afford or figure out how to store, and you need to know how to produce food. Because we we aren't ever going to be able to do any kind of resistance without a food supply. Um, 
and um, yeah, it's uh, it's just I wake up in the mornings. I'm like, oh my god, every day there's a new thing coming in on the news, and it seems to me they're really, really, really clamping down on it now. They're really tightening the grip. So I have, you know, there you, you you've seen the stuff where they're wargaming uh, a food crisis scenario in Europe now because they know what they did to the farmers there. And they're wargaming it for this year. They know that this year there's a food crisis in Europe. There will be food riots. There will be people that can't afford to eat. There will be food supply disruptions. Uh, and and now they're doing the exact same formula here in the United States, See, in Oregon and Maine. Uh, there's apparently 10 other states that have that same legislation that they used in Maine. Who, Texas, they just used you know, the, the energy weapons to destroy a million acres and God knows how many cows. It's happening. It, it, it's happening. It really is. And it, it's frightfully real. <laughs> so uh, well, I always have the numbers for I... you then, because uh, yeah. I was looking at Ukraine grain production will be five to percent, five to 10 percent. And that's on the high end of its normal yields, which is 30 million tons come out of Ukraine normally. And then that includes corn and wheat. And uh, 20 or 20 million tons of that gets sent off to more impoverished nations in Africa. That was their main customer base right there. But if you're going to knock that down to, let's say, 5%, then you're already starting at a negative. And you're right, the farmers, how much are they going to plant? Because the way that this is just incredibly nefarious, but genius at the same time, and I give credit where credit is due, but you are going to meet your maker for what you have done is they've taken and passed so much legislation. They knew that the farmers would come to this point where they would start coming to the capitals with their tractors. They knew the farmers would start dumping food on the roads. They, they gamed this out also, but at the very end of the run is the farmers stopped producing food, which is what, these globalists had wanted and intended to do anyway was to stop the global food supply. But if they on high were going to stop it and put fingers with their puppet masters and they just said, all right, lock off all the supermarkets, everybody would overthrow them in about a fifth of an eighth of a second. But if you put so much legislation in place that it causes the farmers to then start the protests and the farmers carry out the deed of not growing the food, stopping the food on the highways, destroying transit shipments of food across borders they've carried out the exact same and, and got the exact same objective outcome but this time they used the farmers to do it to ourselves to stop the food supply versus them doing it where we could point a finger now it's the farmers and see that's this is how they're going to do it they're going to use the citizens to carry out the objectives which they have in mind at the end goal but then you'll say, well, it was because of the riots. It was because of the banking collapse. It was because of this. It was, because of, it was the people that did it. It wasn't those mighty on high in their ivory towers. So, you know, digest on that for just a minute. They wanted the food to stop and the food is stopping. The farmers are stopping the food now. So where does it go from here? And you brought up a valid point there, Marjorie. Are the farmers in Europe going to plant? And at what percentage would they plant compared to their normal year? That's a, a very valid question to, to start crunching some numbers on. Yeah. Wow. I had no idea that the, the Ukraine numbers were so low. That's like 5%. I mean, they were a major... 10, 10 at maximum. That's a high range. Yeah. 10. Yeah. Well, how could they? I mean, they're, they're, they're starting to conscript women. Like they, they've, they, they hardly have any, they, they, they apparently they'll even take 60 year old men going into the military. I mean, they, they've lost so much manpower and then all those fields, you know, bombed out, destroyed, you know, all the infrastructure. Remember, it was, uh, I think it was last winter, they destroyed a whole bunch of the electrical grid. How could anybody possibly be growing food under those conditions? So, yeah, absolutely. And that, but that was such a critical, critical piece of Europe's thing. And then what the, the whole European thing, it's, it's just melting down. And, and the thing is, is it's here too. It seems like it's been a little more guerrilla warfare here, right? So, the Texas fires or, you know, the Ohio train wreck or, uh, you know, this problem. Uh, God, how many times do you see a thing where 100,000 chickens were killed because of some fire or something and, you know, here and then there and then here and then there. And it, how many jingle blocks 
do they take out before the whole thing falls down? And I, I agree with you. I think it's brilliant that they have structured it so that humans are fighting humans over a game that they have put in place, the global cult that are managing this planet uh, or have control of this planet. Um, um, yeah, what are we going to do? You know, I I really, and I think ultimately what's going to happen is when as people start to figure this out, they're going to sacrifice, the, the global cult is sacrificing all the minions that they put in place in legislature because that's where a lot of the anger is going to go to eventually. I think that we should expect to see an incredible amount of uh, violence and anger directed at the political system. I don't know if we, we know how to get to the global cult themselves, but no matter what way we look at this from the big picture, it's going to be, this is it. This is the time when it gets really, yeah, and you're right. You mentioned the banking system, like, oh my God, that's like almost the smallest problem on my mind right now. And then that's ready to collapse at any moment, right? Did, did you see the thing um, of all the US dollars that have ever been created over time, 25% of them were just made in the last year. Like we're, we're on that hyper, you know, like, I don't know why inflation isn't showing up so big time here in the United States, but man, when it hits, as soon as those BRICS nations start to really switch on, I think here it's going to be, you know, it's going to be flash hyperinflation. In Weimar, Germany, it took eight or nine months for it to really take off, but I think it's going to happen here much quicker. So when it does hit, but we are in a world of hurt. And, uh, you know, I, I just want to encourage everybody who's watching this or listening to this you're awake and aware and you're ahead of the curve. And if you aren't growing food right now, please start getting the skills to do that. It's actually really easy and a lot of fun. It's the most enjoyable thing I do every day, right? It's totally how I de-stress from all of this stuff. But also buy backup food and be prepared to, to, to help your community and help your neighbors. Do your best you can to, I'm doing that, you know, to try and get people to prepare for this. Because it's it's coming, and then there's the uh, oh my god, the October twenty fourth event, which, which um, we don't know what's going to go on with the tides globally around the world. This is <laughs> this year is oh my gosh, you know, It'll be interesting. Feel... But please understand, there are solutions, and homegrown twenty thirty dot com is one of those solutions. Marjorie has a a free webinar up there that'll really let you dip the toe deeply in the water on how you can take back some of your own food production under your own wing no pun intended with the chickens and what you can do to get some backyard meat production and protein production underway as well. Like there's so many ideas in there that it's a well done, uh, in a webinar that touches through so many things on raised bed gardens, kind of tools you can need where to find some of these tools and then how to get uh, simple meat production. And you went through the does and, and that sort of thing. And what you can garner just from that free webinar would be enough to start you on your journey to really start to look at the options out there and then take that and discuss it. It's not just you watching it yourself. It's you to watch it first, take some notes and some timestamps on it, and then share it with your family. Because as you know, and I know both, we get, there's no way one person's going to be doing all this food production for a family and a farm. It takes multiple people because it is rigorous and strenuous. It's hot in the summer. You come in soaked. You need some time off. If your fans aren't working powers out and uh, there's no AC, you, you're going to have to do old school, like go lay in the forest where you know the wind funnels down off of a like a creek bed somewhere so you can not overheat and have heat exhaustion. You know, and then it's, it's coming into the harvest time. There's a huge, 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 like nature overproduces so much. If you think, well, I'm not, if I have a couple of plants, it's so prolific that you're going to have extra to share. And then you should start thinking about bartering too. So then take it to the next step is after you produce – how do you trade that for something? And, you know, homegrown2030.com. I encourage you to go check that out. And, uh, you know, Marjorie, I know you can talk more about it since you're the one who created yeah. the uh, the webinar. But I was just saying the solutions are there. They're truly there. They, right they really are. And I, I got to tell you, I I don't know if we've, we'll go into my story maybe on another podcast. But I will tell you that when I had the wake up call to learn how to grow food, which was um, the most shocking event that's happened in my life, I totally, totally... I'm so grateful for that because that honestly has been the best thing that I've ever done in my life is growing my own. I always produce about half of my own food, no matter where I am. And yes, you can do things in condominiums and apartments. By the way, I also, you know, I've been 
teaching people and researching and learning and figuring out what is the fastest and easiest ways to produce a lot of calories and more importantly, nutrition, which is the elephant in the room. Americans are more malnourished than God, your worst, you know, African country. We have no nutrients in the food supply. How do you do that? And all these years, you know, I try to get people to grow food, go food, and they they don't. So it's always I've always known. Well, people are not going to come to this until there's a real crisis. So, how do you grow food when it really counts? You're under a time crunch. You have no experience, and you're probably older and out of shape. So <laughs> that is who the webinar is designed for. Because I've you know it's just become apparently obvious to me that that is going to be the situation for 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 the majority of people that are going to be coming to this. And and you're right. I it really is. I've I've taught I teach a very simple system in that webinar for how to produce at least half of your own food. And I, I go over the calories and the servings and the nutrition and what it looks like day to day and what here's what the chicken coop looks like and here's what the you know and 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 how do you manage this and you know you know breeding and 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 that kind of thing. So um and it but it really I mean I've I've had kids operating this system. And I've had elders doing it. Um, you know, it's it's very, very simple. You can do this. You know, you're going to have a learning curve. Yeah, for sure. But it really is. And I've dr drilled it down. There's there's tons and tons of ways to grow food, right? You know, there's honey, there's mushrooms, there's goats, there's like a gazillion ways to grow food. But these three that I've selected in the webinar, which is our gardens, chickens and rabbits, are the most calorically dense, nutritionally dense, and the easiest to operate and the quickest to get production up and going for, you know, the average person, like I said, who knows nothing, maybe they're older, they're out of shape. Um, so, you know, rabbits, definitely. And, you know, if you get like, oh, I don't know if I could kill the poor bunny, I totally understand that. That's why we have community, right? There are hunters or fishermen in your community and you go, okay, here, I've got a litter of 10 bunnies why don't you take two and process them all and bring me back the other eight or however you work it out, right? That's why we we do that, which by the way, um, processing small game like that is a skill that used to be like everybody knew, every children, adults, teen, everybody knew how to do that. It used to be like tying your shoes, which now that we have Verilco <laughs> is also no longer a common skill, but everybody, you know, it's 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 not that hard to do and and, and easy to learn. By the way, this system is also set up that it can be fully operated without electricity. So um, most of the production happens fairly real time so that you don't have to like store a bunch of it anywhere, you know, the gardens you're eating from. I'm also a huge fan of, of the chickens. Um, I, I recommend six laying hens and a good laying hen will raise about 250 eggs a year. And a medium-sized egg is about 62 calories, which is a number I got from the USDA, which is, uh, I love Joel Salatin. He calls them the US duh. <laughs> I go to Joel's um, farm up there. We live about six hours. We drove up there from where I live in Tennessee, went up to Virginia, and uh, it was in a nice, you know, rural area out there. And it's good, good information there too. He's, bless his heart, you know, and he's in that niche of of helping small farmers become regenerative. And, and I've always been, I don't, I don't want to deal with the farming because I never wanted to deal with the complexities of the legal system. I said, listen, I'll just always stick to backyard food production because I just don't want to, you know, the other real reason why we need, Oh, by, by the way, those 62 calories per average egg, let me get back on that track. Six laying hens, 250 eggs a year. They do take some time off to molt their feathers or if it gets too hot or too cold production can vary. But if you think about it, six hens, 250 eggs, that's 1,500 eggs in a year. Uh, and that is going to be three egg omelets for you for breakfast every day of the year. So you've got breakfast totally handled. Uh, and then you'll have 33 dozen eggs to trade or give away or use as ingredients in, in, in other things. So, and, you know, you can go buy some laying hens right now. Go to, you want to get a, a hen that's about five or six months old. They, that's when they, when they start laying. Uh, and, um, you, you can pick them up at a, a, you know, off of Craigslist even, or, uh, your feed store or ask around, you, you build a chicken coop and I'll show you what one looks like in that, in the webinar. Um, it's, um, you can build the coop, you know, if you aren't good at building coops, well then hire somebody to build the coop or, you know, talk somebody into building the coop. I mean, that can be built like in a matter of two weekends, right? It just doesn't take that long. Buy the hens. 
I recommend everybody start out buying chicken feed. It's available and it's still fairly inexpensive right now. And you have so many other things to learn. Yes, there are ways that you can ultimately create the food for your chickens, but you've got so much to learn. Don't have that be one of the things. Plan that. That'll be stage two, right? <laughs> That's not stage one. And like, bam, I mean, really in three weeks after the hens have settled in, you know, because they you've moved them and, and they've got some adjustment. But really in three weeks, you can be having breakfast every day of your life now figured out, right? That's huge. That's And I think it's almost like uh, 95,000 calories a year, right? It's one meal, one really good, solid, nutritious meal a day figured out in three weeks. So there are a lot of solutions that you can do very quickly and very simply. So um, yeah, homegrown2030.com. I've condensed 20 years of figuring out how to teach people, figuring out what are the easiest things and the fastest things, and then how to teach people of that in the most effective way. Um, and it, and it's free because, uh, <laughs> you know, it has to be. We've got the... We're really at this point where we're at war, right? I've been talking to Mike Adams about this, and we have this. We we are at war, um, and the first tactic in in any war is to destroy the food supply. And I am I'm like I was on a show the other day. I think it was on Sarah Westall's show. I was begging people to grow food because if you can't eat, then you will totally be at the mercy of them for when they want to feed you. You'll do whatever you have to do to get food. Um, so, but if you have your own food supply, you have a fighting chance of, uh, we have a, humanity has a fighting chance of, uh, I believe in the chaos of what's coming. We actually do have a chance to actually, um, get out of the grip of the global cult, uh, that has and really you and I were talking earlier and I, I believe it's about 12,000 years that, that, that humanity has been under this control. So when you hear people talking about, Oh, human nature, you know, we're always fighting each other or wars or no, that's not human nature. I believe though that we have an opportunity to become free of this control that we have. But the only way we can do that is if you can eat. I, I tried being a breathitarian once and it didn't work real well. <laughs> <laughs> it's you know i like food i'm totally into food oops and i got a cat who wants to visit she is totally a camera ham ah, stop it and she goes on to a different path to keep the true knowledge yeah because you can't live without the fats and you know and i want to say we live near uh, an amish farm and we buy our hogs from them and then they have them processed in a different amish farm it's about 30 minutes away but when we went over mm -hmm. there to the uh, to the butcher because they do deer also and uh, we noticed they had a bunch of extra, you know, fat laying around and whatnot. So we got bones for our dogs from some of the cattle. Uh, and they had a, some beef or some uh, fat laying around. And we got a, a little scraps of that. They gave us probably about 15 pounds. And we rendered some fat down ourselves. Come to find out all the Amish get all the fat from all the uh, pigs. And then oh, they yeah. render down themselves and then can it. So one guy over in our Amish farm has said, hey, you're going to go get your hogs and pick up all the smoked meat and everything. Can I arrange for you? Can you bring the, the all the fat back? He's got about a 300 pound of fat and stuff wrapped up in bags. Can you bring it back here? And I was like, yeah, of course. So I brought it back and then we started talking about fat. I tell you what, about two days later, he came over and he had like jars of this stuff canned. His wife had canned it, pressure canned it and just gave, gave it to us like, hey, thanks for going over and bringing the fat back to it. So I was blown away like, what? Dude, I would do that for nothing just because you're our neighbor and it's just like helping each other. And I know y'all don't want to run a horse in the middle of the night to go do this stuff. Jeez, that's the least I could do is, you know, it was like drop something a mile from my house on my way back. Like, and I was just so shocked, the generosity of that, but get in there with your local communities and understand where there's other fat sources. Cause you are absolutely going to lose your mind if you don't have fat to consume because your brain will consume itself. And when I say lose your mind, I really mean it in a true sense. Like for the last thing to talk here for a second, if you don't have any fats in your brain, what happens to your body there? Yeah, fat is so important. And and um, it, it comes from, and that's why animal products are so important because you've never gone into a garden and gotten a fatty vegetable, right? There's no there's no fat in there. It, the, the fat is actually the most difficult macronutrient to produce. After that is protein, after that is carbohydrates, and then fibers are everywhere. So of the macronutrients, fat is the most important. I went to Cuba 
in 2012 to interview survivors of their special period, which was, you know, the Cuban economy plummeted 60% overnight. Uh, the lights went out, the water went out, the average Cuban lost about 20 pounds. And one of the conversations really struck me was like they had no fats. And the, this one woman was telling me people's faces turned gray and their skin was like flaking off because they had no fats. Yeah. And people were, people were, there was all kinds of, of mental problems. So there's a lot of really great fats in eggs. And then uh, people say, well, what about rabbits? And I like, I overfeed my rabbits because I want the fat, right? So mm. you, you can produce fat, you know, uh, it's uh it's uh, it's it's you can do it, and it's vitally important that you you do do it. Remember, homegrown twenty thirty to uh, access that webinar, and please leave some comments below so we can grind on those comments a bit and try to get you some answers the next time we talk. Because you know, Marjorie and I have been trying to do this on a monthly, but I was busy traveling this last month. You know, looking for information on the, on some events coming up here, title events and thing. But if you do have questions please ask them and I will be happy. And, you know, Marjorie will take a look also at the video and, and see if there's yeah. anything there that we can answer for you uh, to keep the conversation going, but also answer some questions to get you pointed in the right direction. So thanks for watching. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on and start growing food. <laughs> start you, growing David. food. It. it is the time. Yeah. Bye for now.